a very good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to welcome you here in Ede at the Maurits Caserne. My name is Jasmijn Mielg. I will be the moderator of today. And you are here at the Festival of Recognition and Rewards. I spoke to some people here in the audience this morning and I asked them, what are you looking for today? And a lot of you answered, inspiration. Some of you answered, I would like to know a little bit more about the program. I'm new in this field. Others said, I am looking for small actions to create great impact. And I hope you will find everything you seek here today. Before we start with a very interesting program, I would like you now all to take a really brief moment for reflection. The theme is of today is recognition and rewards with a focus on, diver on diversified and talented teams. So take a moment to arrive here in Ede at this festival and take a moment to think about a team you are part of yourself. You can close your eyes if you like. You can look at the point on the ground and think of a team you are part of. What is your role in this team? What does this team look like? And if you have thought of a team you're part of, can you think of another team you're part of? What is a team? Is it just a group of people working to together? Think of another team you're part of. What is your role? What are your talents you're using in that team? And maybe you can even think of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more teams you're a part of. And take a moment to look at the program you've got in your hands with all the workshops on it. If you go to the back side of your program, you will find a page with notes on it. That's the workshop sheets. You've got it all, you found it all in your chair and you have some several pages with notes. And I'd like to invite you to write down all the things you have been thinking about during this day so you can remember that and tell them to your team back home or back at your work. A small game we are going to play before we dive into the program. Write down as many teams you can think of on your notes. Can be a team at work, can be teams at home, maybe a hobby. So take a small moment to write down as many teams as you can think of. It's a game, so try hard. And I know there are a lot of scientists here and they say, what is the definition of a team? Yes, what's the definition of a team? I see people writing. I see people thinking. Who is ready? Raise your hand. Who's ready with writing down? I think you'll need some more time. I see not see all the hands. Yeah. We'll take one more minute. Write down as many teams as you can think of. Final seconds. Yes. All right. Thank you. 
Now you think, what's the game? You can all rise, please. I would invite you to rise. And you're allowed to sit down. So if you had zero teams you could think of, please sit down. Zero teams. Who had one team who could think of? Please sit down. I think we have to move further. Two teams. Four or less. Six. Six teams or less. Eight. Okay, we're coming closer. Ten or less teams, please sit down. Twelve teams. Okay, 14 teams or less. <laughs> all right, all right, let's see. We've got some three finalists. Thank you very much. And, and uh, let's see if we can start this. Can I start this? Olaf? Yes. Let's see. Is it on? Yes. yes. Let's go over here. You've got more than 14 teams. What's your name? Leon van der Broeke. What team is really important to you? <laughs> one of the themes that is really important. One, think of one of the themes. Center for Religion and Law. Wow, this is a lovely title. What makes it so special? Um, it's a collaboration uh, in a multidisciplinary setting of theologians, religious scientists, historians, political scientists, and very much jurists. Thank you very much. A collaboration of so many different people. So we've got Leon, thank you very much. And over here, we've got... Hi, Martijn Gerritsen, Radboud University Medical Center. Can you name one of your favorite teams and what makes it so special? My family. Wow, this is really a strong appla applauding for that. Yes, over here, finalist. We've got Leon and your name once again? Martijn, Leon and Martijn, and we've got Laura over here. From TU Eindhoven, and I'm here with my colleague today. He's working on grant support at TU Eindhoven. And, uh, so she's here with her colleagues from TU Eindhoven. Thank you very much, Laura. And final finalist, Candy Rowe, you're one of our keynote speakers. Yeah, like teams. You're like teams. <laughs> so a big applause for all of the finalists. Leon, Martijn, Laura, and Candy Rowe! Woo! <laughs> and I know you're all... Oh, I don't have to use it. Um, I know you're all part of teams. We all know that. And now I would like all of you to find somebody new here in this room and answer the following question with one person. Reflecting on the teams in your life, is there one that feels particularly rewarding and why. So I take two minutes to find someone new here in this room and just reflect on this question.
Yes. Well, so this this is really this is really one of the ingredients that make today a success having meaningful conversations with one another. I had a lovely conversation with Jeroen. F he told me about his colleagues, his former colleagues from Utrecht University, and we had really meaningful conversations. And that's my wish for you today, having meaningful conversations with one another. It's now time to continue with a meaningful conversation of the theme of today. And I would like to invite Bente van Wanrooy, Jeroen Geurts and Kim Huipen on stage. All right, I think we can stand. We've got some few, you can choose a chair, you can stand, make it yourself comfortable. So first of all, I would like to introduce to you Bente van Wanrooy. She is the chair of the Dutch PhD candidate network, the national network, and she's also PhD candidate at Utrecht University working on UFA. I'm sorry. <laughs> UFA. Um, on working on education. Thank you very much. So my first question is to you, Bente. You are an early a start career academic, an early career academic. What do you think is so important about team recognition? Ooh, so many things, I would say, but especially for early career researchers, uh, it's really about also acknowledging that each individual has different specialties or expertise that they can work on. And at this point, we're not really yeah, assessing or recognizing that there's some people who are better at uh, teaching, some are better at research, some are also making a lot of impact. So I think especially for early career researchers, we have to acknowledge that there's so many diverse talents that in a team can work together very well, but that we're not really, yeah, we're not really focusing on that right now. So really diversified team. Thank you very much. Now, beside you is Jeroen Geurts. He's Rector Magnificus of VU Amsterdam. I've got a really... <laughs> I'm curious, how many teams could you write down? To be honest, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> a lot of teams. A lot of teams. Different sizes, different compositions, but a lot of teams. And one of your favorites, what is that? Well, I would say uh, the, the, the home base team is very important. Uh, if you, uh, so, so I agreed with uh, what was Martijn? before yeah. with Martijn, yeah. Uh, your home base has to be in order, otherwise you feel it in all the other teams that you're part of. Perfect. So over there is Kim Huipen, she's Program Manager of Recognition and Rewards at the Universities of the Netherlands. Kim, what do you wish the audience today to, to happen to experience here? Yes, and I, uh, yeah, my home base work-wise is Universities of the Netherlands, but with our Recognition and Rewards program, we uh, of course work for universities, university medical centers, research institutes, research funders, uh, and the Royal Academy um, um, in the Netherlands. So we hope to, yeah, in one way work together all um, as a team. Um, and what I hope for today, because it's the fourth Recognition Rewards uh, Festival, um, the second one in real life, so we can really, really connect. And uh, that would be, um, I think, um, my first wish um, for you to connect uh, with each other. And it could be in this room, uh, in the workshops, uh, in the uh, in the breaks, um, uh, but also afterwards. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we developed with our team um, this workshop uh, booklet, because uh, you can also, I think, and I hope actually for today, is that you that it was very difficult for you to choose a workshop because mm. there are so many great workshops uh, and that you might be able to connect with, so, uh, with one of the um, developers from another workshop after. Uh, this festival and we also have our community platform uh, review um, and you can also connect afterwards uh, as well and yeah next to connecting I also wish that you will be inspired um, both on the content level perhaps by the words or the narratives we use but also inspired by the tools and the methods used and um, in the workshops so inspiration, and that's also what the people here are looking for. Thank you very much. Since 
visuals, graphics, photos, sometimes say more than thousand words, we ask you to give us a picture. And I think we will have Bentus first. Could you tell us, could you explain us why you chose this picture, Bente? Yeah. Uh, terrible quality picture because I <coughs> often at these events that you organize, you tend to forget to make pictures if you're super busy, which you notice. But uh, I brought a picture of one of our PhD organization days of PNN. Uh, we're a national level network and we find it very important to bring together all the PhD representatives from all over the Netherlands to well, inspire each other, see each other, meet with each other, and also acknowledge that what they are doing as a PhD representative, one of the, of the things they do alongside everything else they are doing in their research, that we also yeah, acknowledge that th what they are doing, in as which is not always recognized as part of their PhD, that it's something that we value and that we enable them to do that work very well. Uh, so that is why I brought this picture and it al also closely connects to an essay that we published yesterday on our website where we see that we want to diversify how we assess PhD uh, trajectories and also the final um, yeah, the final assessment, how do we also acknowledge and see that things like this or things like this where PhD candidates put in time and effort, that that's also part of what we find important and that we, yeah, I think it's very important that we acknowledge that there's so many hardworking people doing these things or impact or other types of valorization alone, but also a lot in teams. And I think that's, uh, yeah, that's very important for us to acknowledge that better. And also, yeah, why I brought this picture. Thank you very much. Let's continue to the anecdote of Jeroen Geerts. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I just want to read um, part of the original poem that these images are uh, representing. So, and, though, uh, and so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. So oft in theological wars, the disputants, I ween, tread on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prayed about the elephant not one of them has seen. So this uh, I, I sometimes um, um, refer to uh, the fable of the blind man and the elephant. Uh, who, who of you knows about this fable? Yeah, a lot of them. So it's, it's quite famous. Um, and I think this exactly um, summarizes what we need to do. We need to form teams because otherwise we prayed about an elephant that we have never seen. Uh, we will not understand the thing that we're trying to study, uh, the, tring the thing that we're trying to build, if we don't uh, combine perspectives. So we need different talents uh, in teams to, to build uh, that picture. Why did I choose this? I chose it because I think there are two um, phases in recognition and rewards. When we started in t uh, 2018, it was mostly important that people uh, started with career paths, uh, with uh, thinking about what are talents and how can we develop different talents. So all universities and uh, universal, uh, university medical centers now have their career paths. But if we don't go to phase two, which is the team, uh, thinking in terms of teams instead of individuals, then the whole of recognition and rewards will uh, still fail. And that is a big thing to say, but I think it's true. So we will still fail if we don't go to phase two and build a world where people think in terms of teams and not uh, just their own uh, simplified perspective. So that's something that I would like to um, inspire you with today. Thank you very much. And then the final picture, Kim. Thank you. I uh, also think that some of you recognize uh, this picture yeah. uh, from a booklet from my childhood. So you also see that I made a real scan from um, uh, <laughs> um, my parents probably bought in the 1980s. Um, and you also probably see uh, that I did something with this uh, picture because in the 1980s, we apparently thought that everyone has the same uh, skin color, um, but that is actually not true. Uh, and being an aunt of a little nephew uh, of color, um, I more and more realize how important it is to uh, yeah, 
show color, not only in children's books, uh, but everywhere. So that's part of the story. Uh, but you also see musicians, uh, of course, and this book is about an orchestra. Uh, and every musician has a different talent, plays a different instrument. But playing in an orchestra uh, also is about listening to each other. It's also about um, making sure that the one sitting next to you um, will be heard. So enhancing the, 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 the musician uh, with you in the orchestra. And I also think that that's really important uh, of yeah, working together in a team um, is that not everyone should be the star of the show. Uh, it should be that the orchestra, um, that you together make this very, very beautiful um, sound, that you play very beautiful music together. Um, so that's what I also hope for uh, working together in academia, um, is that it will be more about what you do together uh, in research, in teaching, in impact, in patient care, in leadership roles, um, and that not one of these specific talents is more important than the other. Thank you very much for sharing these stories. We will have plenty of time to get inspired today and work together in harmony. Thank you, Jeroen Geurts, Kim Huipen, Bente van Lamhart. Well, we'll dive a little bit deeper in the inspirational parts of the program because it's not just about work. It's about the spirit of collaboration, constructive challenge and a shared drive to make a difference. That's the belief of Karen Strobans. She is the director of Culture Base and vice chair for the Coal Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment. And she was a very proud member of the drafting group for the agreement on advancing research assessments. Karen brings a perspective shaped by both professional passion and personal teamwork. Please join me in a warmly welcome for Karen Stromans. Karen, the floor is yours. Let's see if this is working. Is that close enough? Is that it's working? all about teamwork, isn't it? This is working. <laughs> I think we need another team member here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have this talent. Is it? Probably, or I can hold it for you. I think, we're, this I is think we're, is that, we're Can you hear me? All right. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and for the help with the setup. So first, maybe two caveats before I, I read the column. The first caveat is um, that I think I've diverted slightly from the title in the program. So I'll just give you a new title in a second. Second caveat, I did not coordinate with Kim on the picture she was just discussing. So just <laughs> nice coincidence, as you will hear about in, in a moment. So. The kind of new title I chose for this column is The Sum Plus Team, More Than the Sum of Its Talents. Reflection is such a central part of recognition and rewards. And so it was a pleasant consequence of being asked to write and to read this column that it's pushed me really to reflect on what it means to work in a diversified and in a talented team and how the development of such a team can be incentivized. Reflecting on my own experiences as a starting point, a key observation has been that the drivers that have held together the various teams that I've been part of over time, but also across different sectors, have been wide ranging. Some teams were only identified as such through having a common line manager and admittedly, a lot of shared frustration. They operated on a very individual basis to deliver their work. Others were driven by a strong sense to support one another and make contributions to each other's work, though still very much in a quid pro quo way 
and through the lens of individual achievements. And then there's been the teams that were really held together by a common goal. The teams that added up to more than the sum of their talents. This observation begs the question, what distinguishes the latter from the former? Personally, I've experienced the goal-driven team much more in roles outside academia, in voluntary roles. And generally, I have observed a persistent focus on the individual within university-based research teams. So assuming my anecdotal understanding has any representative value, two options seem to present themselves for those who would like to be part of a team that's more than the sum of its talents. I continue to refer to this as a sum plus team. Either look for a role outside academia, and not just any role, you'll have to be very selective there as well, or contribute to a culture shift away from the individual and towards the sum plus team within academia. Given the audience today in this room, I suggest we focus on the latter. As a starting point, let's explore some of the characteristics of the sum plus team, and then delve into how changes to recognition and rewards can enable these. To more clearly illustrate what distinguishes a sum plus team, I took inspiration from Dennis Sherwood, who in one of his blogs describes high-performing team through comparison with a football team or an orchestra. If we think about what distinguishes a football team from a random group of people running after a ball, or a harmonious orchestra from a discordant one, key char char characteristics include, first, that the football team or harmonious orchestra exists of a diversity of profiles that complement one another. The goalkeeper has vastly different skills from the striker, and the violinist has been selected for very different strengths than the drummer. And second, that it is steered by a manager or a leader who can think strategically about the competencies, talents, and backgrounds that are required to form the Sun Plus team and bring together that team around a common goal. The success of a football team is often associated with its coach, and no orchestra takes to the stage without its conductor. Building on these two key characteristics, I'd like to finish with a few concrete suggestions aimed at those in the audience who are responsible for the recruitment, development, and fostering of teams, with some plus potential, dare I add. And if you aren't in a position to do so today, please hold on to these recommendations for when you might be in the future. First, I recommend that funders, institutions, and departments give more weight to the people management competencies of the team leaders they hire, promote, and fund. The assumption seems to prevail that a good researcher by default develops into a strong team leader, while the competencies needed to deliver on these roles are vastly different. A good striker, striker will not always be a good coach, nor is a good tubist necessarily a good conductor. More efforts are needed to ensure that where management competencies are required to deliver in a role or on a project, this is reflected in funding, recruitment, and promotion criteria. This should include selecting for leaders who are able to set a common goal and strategically think about which skills and competencies are needed to deliver it. Second, I recommend that funders, institutions, and the team leaders on the ground stop desiring five-legged sheep, a Dutch expression meaning to look for so many qualities in one person that they probably don't exist. Currently, what is often expected of an academic is the equivalent of expecting a star goalkeeper to also be a talented striker and a master passer, or a skilled violinist to at the same time be a virtuous pianist and a gifted drummer. Active efforts are needed to develop and recruit for different roles that each form an, an essential part of the teams. This could include the recruitment of co-group leaders, for example, where one provides scientific leadership and the other managerial skills. Different roles should also lead 
into different career trajectories inside or outside academia. Third, I recommend that funders, institutions and departments reflect on what is appropriate to assess at the individual versus the team level, in addition to which criteria are most suitable to do so. In a team where individuals truly complement each other, the success of the team is a shared success. As for an orchestra, delivering a stunning performance relies on the contributions of all musicians. While there is a cl clear rationale for assessing competencies at the individual level, for outcomes and impacts, which relate more closely to the common goal, these are arguably better evaluated at the level of the team. The I-norm scope framework sets out useful steps to evaluate only where necessary and can be helpful to determine where and what to assess and how to do so responsibly. These conclude my suggestion towards assessment of a SUMPLUS team. Whether you subscribe to these approaches or not, I hope you can agree with me that aiming for teams that are more than the sum of their talents and that are driven by a common goal over individual ego is worth our while. And I wish that you all can further explore ways of achieving this during the rest of the festival today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will continue with a panel dialogue. We will start exploring what team di diversified teams means. And therefore, I would like, first of all, to introduce to you, let's see who we've got here. I pronounced it, I've practiced it so many times. Sean Sapkuriu. And there we've got San Lifas. Welcome, welcome. So maybe first a question to the audience. Do you know there is a center for unusual collaborations? Yes, I didn't. But who knows is definitely knows is San Lifaz here. He's one of the fellows and he's really striving, trying to contribute to accessible and sustainable academia. Open source, hardware of open science, that's really what you're into. What does unusual collaboration mean? Uh, yeah, there is one in the spirit, uh, which is that you usually do not see. Uh, that's the collaboration means. In, in this case, means transdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary collaboration. But then the people at the center, because they have to have practical measures, they also have defined Unusual collaboration means that you should have people from three universities, from three different disciplines. So it's a bit of a mechanistic definition for Sh practical purposes. Should it stay unusual forever? Yeah, I, I think collaboration, for the sake of collaboration, it's a good exercise, but I don't think we should earn our income because of just collaborating. Thank you. So now we're switching towards the standard CV, curriculum vitae. So that is actually not the best way to select the best candidate, or at least that's, that's what Jean Sabkiriou thinks. He led, um, he led the implementation of a narrative CV, or as we call it nowadays, a narrative profile. What are the benefits of a narrative CV, Jean? So I think there's two benefits of a narrative CV. Um, one is kind of a semi-standardization around good questions, right? Because the traditional academic CV, CV can be kind of anything and can be from two pages to 200 pages, depending on how amazing the person is. Um, <laughs> and the narrative CV allows kind of focus and structure that allow a little bit of consistency, um, but that consistency is around a broader range of what can be recognized or what should be recognized and rewarded in, in, in research and other activities. So what should be recognized and rewarded? Everything. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the CV that we use, it kind of follows international standards coming from the Royal Society and the, and the UK model where we think about what are the contributions of a person or maybe a team towards, um, towards society, 
towards the scientific enterprise, towards knowledge creation, towards teams and people, towards the, the sector itself, right? So kind of this broader, diverse range that people can find themselves and find their niche in. Sonli, yes. you said you would like to ask the question, the, aud the audience a question. Do you remember what question you Oh, you mean the composition? Yes. I, I asked and you if you know the answer, but maybe. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't have a, the exact answer, but Sanli Fasi is not only a member, a fellow of unusual collaborations, but he's, he's also uh, a member of the Young Academy. Yeah. Yes. And he was really wondering what the audience here is. Who are you? So let's try, let's try to find it out. Yeah, maybe we do your way. It also becomes less boring. So who is here actually on a, you know, more than 50% teaches or does research in a lab? Stand up. <laughs> Teaching and research just at your yeah, department, your university. Your if you're more than 50% teaching. I yeah, so say about people. 10 people, yeah. 12. And yeah, it's 10. allowed to raise up multiple times. Yeah, it's fine, yeah. So who is here because by the assignment or membership of a committee or, I don't know, your hierarchical position, you're responsible for recognition and reward in your institute? Yeah, that I thought. <laughs> who is here because just you're just... Thank you. None of the other ones, but just curious. You know, you're a researcher, a PhD, and yeah, okay. Just yeah. curious. PhDs, for yes, example. Well. Yeah. Okay. Curious. Just curious. Okay, that's I got my answer. That's Maybe someone we didn't mention. It's also very nice to know. Yeah, so someone who wasn't never. Every, everybody was just curious, researcher in education or policy. Thank you very much. Why was it important for you to know, Sanli? Yeah, I mean, so this is a discussion we have about, you know, who talks about and who is affected by. And uh, I think there is a disjoint. And also in like other other things that we have, you have to do at the national level, uh, this sort of distinction now between the people who discuss recognition and reward and people who are affected by it. And I think that there are less people in comparison to the people affected here than the people who discuss it. So there's a bigger proportion of, this is some form of a scholarly discussion of what we really have to do, but without, a proportional representation of the people who are affected by these policies. So the people who is who, who we're talking about should be present here as well. And they are. Yeah, you I are. don't know if they can. There are 20,000 people probably or so. It's not possible. And 20,000 tasks. We what? should be just aware that there must be at some point, some way of really, really asking them what they are affected by and mm. uh, how they are affected by. And don't think that if we agree with each other, they necessarily also agree with us. So back to Sean, you are a program manager, so you're not a researcher yourself anymore. Have you been a researcher ever? Yeah. Yes, yeah, I thought so. You're a program manager at the Luxembourg National Research Fund. Do you talk with researchers? Yes. Yes. And what do they say to you? <laughs> what do what what is their what what are their thoughts about the system we are living in? So so I just wanna to jump in on what Sandy was saying, because that's that's the key, right? We can't sit in our offices and make narrative CV templates and change things and say, this is the right way to do it, go. You need to have researchers in the in the boat. And you need to involve them at, as early as possible throughout the process as possible. I'll give an example of something we've done. Um, it, I mean, it's important for us that everything we do uh, is, is informed by what researchers need, want, with, of course, the, the, the big goals of you know, recognition, rewards, open science, these sorts of policy and, and, and ideas moving forward. But we changed our reporting um, because you know, project reporting for the researchers in the audience is relatively burdensome. Um, and we were getting these reports and not really doing mm -hmm. so much stuff with them, which is a waste of time for everybody, right? So we, we did an internal reflection, said, okay, let's change things. So what we did was, we got researchers, research administrators, uh, finance people, everybody involved in reporting together uh, from all the, inst all the institutions in Luxembourg, so many. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we said, okay, look, let's design an ideal reporting together. It's still the FNRs, right? So we get you know, final say on what it is, but we want to make it easier for you because we want to make it easier for us. And we want to make sure that everybody gets what they so need. So what out. changes did you make? We, we, we slashed everything. Um, so for going from annual reports, so like in a four-year project, every year a report, we have three reports now, a checklist, which is like 
Do you have a collaboration agreement? Is your data management plan okay? Like it takes five minutes to, to, to fill out. More well, reports, but mo less no, minutes. less reports. Oh, less reports, less reports yes. Less, less minutes. reports. The second, the second phase, the midterm report is okay. How are things going? And, and it was really cool because uh, in a meeting with a researcher, they said, you're always asking about deviations and issues and problems. Can't you talk about like how it's evolving or how it's changing? Like a positive spin, just changing the word. And that was inspiring. So, okay, how is, the, how is your project evolving? What's changed? What new hypotheses and data and stuff has come up? That, and how have you dealt with it, right? Reflection. Who knows this new type of reporting already? Who's in Luxembourg? Who's in <laughs> Me. Um, and then the final report is, is because, I mean, it's not evaluated, right? We don't give money based upon the end of a project. It's, it's just a close. So what we do is we ask, okay, what came out? from a lay summary, right? So maybe that we can use that to connect with society and from a scientific point of view, right? And, and not based upon what you promised five years ago or four years ago, it's but, but how is it now? What's changed? What's the status of your project? And how has it contributed to people, society, mm -hmm. teams, knowledge? So suddenly, if you hear the story of Sean about uh, reporting, less reports, less minutes, focusing on other themes than originally themes, yeah. How does it sound for you? Yeah, so it sounds to me like uh, optimization and not a transformation because I wanted to ask you, but exactly you said that you're not giving any money uh, because of this report. There's no actual evaluation of it. The system is still a promise-based system and you evaluate it and you are still responsible to the people who support your finances to actually do something good with it. And you are not collecting, or you just said that we, we evaluate what happened and what is it, but we cannot s still say that, oh, what we have already have promised or what we think that should be the, the, the outcome of it is really going to, to happen. So this is what I call optimization. And sometimes optimizations actually keep the old system in place because you do these small you know, patches here and there. What but at the end, it becomes, well, at the end, it is still because based on, for example, committee. I mean, I, I'm really not a fan of narrative CV because it is very limited aspect. It's a, it's a Imaginary thought to say that, you know, a group of people who do not know these candidates and we chose them because they have to be independent, et cetera, et cetera, can in half an hour, half a day, evaluate what's going to be happening in the next four years. So it is still a promise-based system and not a track record-based system. You do not look at who has really delivered in the past on the promises or actually something that other people respect. And we just purely trust him. Go on for another year. Go on for another year. This A reaction, idea Sean. of committees is still in your optimized system, and that's what actually failing a lot of these evaluations. You said trust, and I think trust is the key word here. Research is inherently risky, yeah. right? When you do something, it's going to fail. Not 80, yeah. I mean, I did a PhD. That's as far as I got. Then I realized I'm a horrible researcher. I need to do something else. Um, right? Have a diversified yeah, career. Yeah, stuff fails. But that's okay. We shouldn't expect that everything is perfect all the time, always, right? We want failures to be uh, okay because they are learning experiences. So we, we're we not giving money expecting return on investment. That's not how we, sh we as funders should be behaving, and institutions as well. We are giving money as an investment in ideas. We trust researchers because theoretically you're intelligent and you have good ideas and you want to work towards, towards yeah. your goals, right? And we shouldn't control, we should trust. And an evaluation should be trust-based and it shouldn't be based upon track record because past, past uh, um, success is not a predictor of future success, this we know. It should be based on good ideas with good teams and 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 then us say, disagree more. let's you, do it. He cannot disagree more. No, let's yeah, yeah, cool. I, I, I mean, trust, I mean, the process should be secured. Scientific process has a definition. It must be robust. You should show it. You fail, fall, show me that if you combine it with open science, then I'm with you. And what do we say, the track record? You say to me that the track record does not show the future, but there is this magical guy who is sitting in the committee and you know, by just the Tom can say, oh, this guy is gonna be positive, this project is a great idea, and you're not. You're putting all the biases in the committees. The committee yeah. is not going to save it for you because exactly it cannot define what's the future success. It is the community that you have built, helped build over time. That's called the university, right? They are looking after each other. They are evaluating each other on a daily basis, week after week. And if the community is trusted, don't trust the person. But if the community trusts it, the community has its you know, accountability in order. The community has its reporting in order, open science in order. 
then you can trust that community because they are internally looking after each other. Sonli and Sean, <laughs> I see you have so many to discuss and we will continue discussing this yeah. topic, but you pointed out some very interesting things about the evaluation committee, promotion committee, and I would love you to stay here on stage and take a seat, relax and listen, write down. We can talk. You can relax and listen because we will continue to someone who says less evaluation, more recognition. That's the ambition of Gunther Cornelissen. Yes, and he is a member of various promotion committees. Gunther Cornelis is also a full professor of mathematics. So, yeah, you can choose, you can, can, can go over there. So, um, Gunther, you are now for a few weeks member of several promotion committees. What is the one thing you would like to change right now? Yeah, it was one of the most frustrating experiences of, uh, of my life these past two weeks. <laughs> um, this committee, these committees are all trying to implement a recognition and reward, and it's like uh, doing a cycle tour, and it's nice, and the weather is nice, and you look around, and suddenly someone sticks a stick into your wheel and flies. And everyone is a bit stuck on how to do it. And I find it a very frustrating experience, and it, it leads to a lot of uh, randomness in the process currently, I think. A random process. Assessment, uh, uh, a world in which we are continuously assessing each other. It's like, it's like there's a big staircase already in scientific information stuff. There are six or seven or whatever steps to take. We are constantly evaluating each other, but evaluating each other not in this kind of crude sense or, or as in organizations doing work, but individually. It's like as if I would be telling you the whole day how you're doing, like the first time of like <laughs> You can, you can. But maybe we're also colleagues and we work together all the time and we also have to assess each other all the time with this very funny Dutch system of the Uber, 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 I don't know, whatever. Yes. So <laughs> time for change, time for change. Thank you, Gunther. I would like to continue to our final member of the panel. We all know, like Karen Strowens just said, there are no sheep with five legs or jack of all trades in English. But someone who's coming quite close is Renske Bauer. She's associate professor in language education and she coordinates multiple teams. Warm Sorry. welcome to you, Renske Bauer. A sheep with five legs, coordinating multiple teams. What are you doing? Yeah, uh, I, I think I'm diversified in myself. <laughs> so I'm a co coordinator of the study program Communication and Information Sciences. I am the coordinator of the research group Language and Education and I am the coordinator of the impact group on Communication, Language and Inclusion. This sounds Thank too you. much, <laughs> too much for one person. How this is maybe not the ideal situation. Or is it for you? For me, it's working. And I'm also thinking on, okay, this, this uh, team, uh, uh, these diversified teams, I don't think the, the route is that you have persons who are totally devoted to research, some that are totally uh, devoted to, to teaching and other ones on, on impact because we have all the roles uh, at the same time. So so we need to find a way on how we can balance it. And for me, it totally works to combine those roles and to 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 bring research into my teaching, to uh, bring the society into my teaching, community engaged learning, but also to to see what questions students bring up and to use this for doing research together together with my students. And this is the only way for me to, to yeah, maybe save To make it work, save time. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine when you have so many tasks and roles, it's really hard to do everything perfect. And it's probably not possible to do everything perfect. And Gunther, I'm curious, how can you evaluate so many different roles and tasks within the promotion committees you are now part of? Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Very difficult. We try to actually look a bit at this individual talent uh, uh, area, not the five legs, but a few legs. A few legs. Mm -hmm. But once you start to think about it, it becomes very difficult on what is your main legs, what is the minimum 
what is the maximum, what compensates what in the entire system. And I would actually propose like to to not think about the next step to take in recognition and rewards, but to step back a little bit and look at what we're doing, actually doing um, to, I was going to say with, but I'm going to say to our employees <laughs> uh, by doing this. And how are they experiencing it? And how is it currently being done? And, and Stas and I look at, at this project of going to actual mid-career promotion committees and see how they, they're functioning and we already discovered that some of them don't exist. This is a big, big discovery for us. What is what yeah. what what don't exist? Uh, a, a promotion committee that uses uh, uses recognition and reward for mid-career inside the faculty itself. Yeah, it's, it's I mean they're still far away from it. Sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't exist, but when it exists, it can have a lot of positive things. We're going to try to catch the positive message, but we're also going to try to catch the the, the this kind of uh, the stick in the wheel. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people struggle with this also at that level, like evaluating it. For example, evaluating a team. If I may give an example of this. Today is about team science. And how are we going to somehow combine the aspect of team science with this system, which is a very individualistic evaluation uh, criteria. So it looks like a person. A person is going to get promoted, not a team is going to get promoted in the current setup. And how are we going to somehow take this into account? What is the most important thing? How are we going to, to, uh, to promote the team? And how are we going to have di a diverse set of people in such a team? So there are a lot of questions. Yes. Are you able to already answer some of those questions? I was thinking about one thing which I would really love to do. Um, early career scientist, I'm thinking it's not it's someone who actually exists, but <laughs> PhD student in math, it's my field, very theoretical mathematics, but also a big graphic accountant. And I could imagine a team in which someone like this is present and is maybe in research and is also designing graphics. But this would be a mixture of a support staff position and a research position. So this is an example that you can only do if you really talk about university personnel, if you really do this kind of combined... And change the system. Change the system. Change the system. Change yeah, or just make it happen. You know? yeah. I mean, it could, could really be possible. And currently, if you try to realize this, this is very difficult. You have to give people two part two part-time positions in different setups, different skills, different HR. So is I'm going to rent now. Is this what's happening in, at your teams? People having several uh, positions, multiple positions? I think they do, but still, I think most of them uh, uh, have to teach for, 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 for most of their, their job. I, I think sometimes 60, 70 percent of their work is teaching. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, it's not only team science. For me, it's working in teams, and and if I think about this, it's it's thinking about what your uh, uh, what your special thing is within those different roles. So sometimes you just perform, you do research, or you uh, uh, you teach, but sometimes We're creating you're impact, in, uh, innovating things that can be in science, it c but it can also be in education. So. Or you're, you're a leader, you have a leadership role uh, in one of those areas. So I think this is the way to excel or specialize. Yes, definitely. Yeah, good yeah. question. Yeah, so, so can you, can you uh, I didn't hear the question. Well, how, do you how do you recognize? How do you recognize it in the current system? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what we do is we have regular meetings, not only lab meetings for research, but we combine this with uh, meetings for education. And then not the administration organi uh, organization of education, but really discussing topics about education. And uh, I also want to share, uh, to show you this uh, booklet. It's uh, 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 written together with the Comenius Network. And we made it to uh, share positive stories about mm -hmm. teaching. And I think that's very important. So what we try to do is to make room for people to bring in uh, uh, inspiring uh, uh, things or ideas, whether it is related to research, impact, or education, there's room for everything. And then you recognize those things. Is that an answer to your question? Is that an answer to the question? 
Well, it's an answer a theoretical answer. If you're new to the question, but I, I actually, I think the Barkon better to teach it in Austin. Most people are actually also involved in the partial upper design teaching. Um, but if you're evaluated as individuals and you have this individual track record and you go and talk to them, and I think sometimes there's a feeling that there is competition in a team of people at the same function level. And we're really talking about money, essentially, or whatever. So the statement we started with with you is less evaluation, more recognition. How can we how can we create that, Gunther? In favor of having less steps in careers. Less steps in careers. So that's one part. I see there are some questions in the audience. So let's turn to the audience. You can ask questions to all the members of the panel, and I think I'm just going with this one. Yes, there's a question also in the back over there. Maybe I'll, I'll go myself. Yeah, um, Let's have I'm one. You can so there. It seems like we think there is this huge problem, and there are almost no solutions. But to me, a lot of these things, like having individual promotion but having team recognition at the same time, I see this in the policy sector where I work. It's it's there. It's it's implemented. We have KPIs as a team that are not trickling down to the level of individual performance evaluation. So. Is there enough outreach to sectors where some of these things are already working? Is there enough learning from other sectors? Or is there this kind of stigma that academia needs to find its own way and needs to solve these issues itself? Is it, would it be a solution to look elsewhere and to take more inspiration from outside? And for who is this question? Um, I think for um, all, all the panels, but I see a lot of nodding in the middle. So maybe nodding in the middle, all right. Yeah. I Working? Yes. Sorry. Yes, I looked a bit at looked a bit at this and at HR and also at my friends who do not work at university. And I always struggle even with this question. So the university is it really something different? Yeah. But yeah. Well, you say no, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have this. Yeah. Oh. There's room uh, to talk in the breaks. There's a question over here, Elizabeth. Yeah, my question is. You asked about recognition, but I felt you meant promotion. And I think there is the, the core of this whole business that uh, we still think that recognition and promotion are the same. And basically, as we heard before in the talk, promotion should be given to those who can foster others. And recognition should be for all doing good work. All right. And who would you like to address this to? Or is it a remark to everyone? Oh, but I actually I uh, understand the sorry. Yeah, sh sh uh, first, uh, Sean? I fully, fully agree with you. And I think it's important to expand on that, right? Recognition can be done in many, many, many forms. It could be a pat on the back, a pizza party, an award pizza. that, you know, a certificate said, hey, you did a great job recognizing you in front of others, right? It's work that you've done that should be recognized by your peers or, or others, right? And that's, we don't do that enough. Right? It's not all about what's going to get you the next job or the next grant. It's what are you doing that contributes to others. And that should be valorized and recognized without having it need to feed into something else. Right, Because that hits your, your, your values, right? the, the self-actualization. I'm doing something, I'm contributing to something, which is important to us. Um, everybody would like to react? Yes, Sanli and then Gunther? Yeah, I think the, the definition that you mentioned and in academia comes very important because there are a lot of mix. I don't think that the, the, the examples of public policy helps to academia, but I think it's very important to make the distinction. And I would like now we have a list and I would like to make an exaggeration so that just make this clear distinction. So we have teams and we have chiefdoms and chiefdoms, they have a chief and the chief decides and the team, the chief decides is accountable to something external or something maybe holistic up there and teams the the leader or whatever unofficial or official is responsible accountable to the team and i'll go back to your list and how many in things in your list are chiefdoms with my definition and how many are teams i bet a lot of things we say we call them teams but they are not teams if the leader is accountable not to the team but to the outside so at the university is my account we have very very little teams, and we have a lot of chiefdoms, which are supposed to keep peace between the chiefs, and that's what becomes this, you know, horse trading negotiation, which we call promotion. I so see a lot of people nodding over there. I think, would you like to react, or can we go to the other questions? Just one, Say, maybe just one brief thing. I'm very aware of this, 
but I'm describing what I sense uh, with my humble work towards it. And this idealistic point of view I completely share, but the question is whether this is actually what is happening yeah. in reality. So we've got m plenty more questions. Uh, I think there's one over here. And we'll we have time for questions. Joanne. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, Gunter, for what you said. I completely agree, and I'm so glad someone said it out loud. And I think if we start talking about recognizing individual talents in the example you gave, um, for example, someone with graphic uh, skills, graphic design skills, there are so many different talents around. And in order to recognize those and then take advantage of them, we need to trust the leader of those teams. So it comes down to a sort of inbuilt trust for different teams to take advantage of the different skills. So my question is, what has to change and at what level in order to allow team leaders to build these kind of talented teams and respect all the skills that are in those teams? Where, where does that change need to happen? Gunther. I think the question Can was I for Gunther. Oh, respond? yeah, Renske, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think we need time. Time for good leadership, but also time for leaders to to uh, um, and and the team to really uh, act act upon this. And I think uh, another another uh, imp a very important thing is to recognize uh, the profession of things. So we all see uh, uh, the 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 profession in uh, as researchers, but for education, I think <laughs> we we still. Uh, uh, have a long way to go to to recognize the profession as teachers, and that also needs that that leaders should be able to to devote time in which you can craft your uh, uh, education. Leadership, trust, and time. Uh, Sean. Very shortly, trust comes top down, in in essence, right? So. University leadership needs to trust the professors or the, the department heads or whatever that they that they hire the, to do the job that they were given to do without too much micromanagement. Those leaders need to trust the people that they hire to do the parts that they were done without too much micromanagement. As soon as the, that, that trust chain breaks for whatever reason, that's when you know the poop hits the fan. There's a question over here. I saw I'm who was over here? There was one. I just saw one hand over here. So if not, we... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Jeroen. Yeah. <coughs> I was just thinking about the, the, the concept of leadership. Uh, I'm not sure that we need only invest in group leaders. I think that the ideal situation would be that we have a group that is sort of so, um, you know, well-versed in leadership on every level that the group leader doesn't matter that much anymore. It's the group that governs itself, uh, that leads itself, um, and, divi and diversifies uh, its roles. So um, that's one thing. The other thing is um, sometimes we kind of get lost in uh, questions of how it should be done. How do we build a diversified team? Do we have the criteria? Do we have the... the um, let's say that the sets of rules, but I would be much more in favor of the uh, spirit of the law than the letter of the law. If we want to have teams, and my big question here would be, why must we work in teams? Why must we uh, focus on teams? Because some people might not be convinced that that is what we should be doing. But if we are convinced that that is what we should be doing, then I would say, the rules of engagement of building teams and the spirit of the law is much more important. Just pile it away, just try things, uh, than making sets of rules again, because we'll, we'll go back to a system or we'll replace a system that we already had and, and weren't satisfied with. So less rules. Would you like to answer any one of the, the Sonli? I, I don't know. I mean, first of all, leadership, this is one of the Hard words. I come from a country which has a supreme leader, right? It's called Iran. And, you know, sometimes the leadership brings me sort of really yokes. But there are two meanings to leadership. And it took me actually quite some time and investigation to find out what the leadership in the recognition reward position paper means. There's a leadership of, you know, follow me and I will bring you to uh, Valhalla or I don't know, whatever that. And there's also leadership of motivation, you know, taking single problem, 
motivating yourself to stand up, come out of bed and solve that problem. That's personal leadership. And that's actually the thing that I guess what's the regarded, it always confuses. In all these evaluation committee, they confuse them completely from each other. You know, for my evaluation committee, leadership means have you been in one of the teaching committees or, mm -hmm. and if it is outside the department, doesn't count because we need leadership here. So that I do want to emphasize the, the, the rules. I think it's very important to look at the rules, to look at the structures, and really from outside be able to evaluate them. I mean, the orchestra was mentioned as it, and my friend plays in the orchestra, in the classical orchestra, it's horrible. You don't want to be in that. <laughs> she told me she's the second violin, and the second violin never talks to the conductor. Only the first violinist is supposed to do that. It's a horrible place. It's not a jazz concert, you know, street dance. Mm -hmm. It's, or there was another example, you know, football teams, how much abuse we have in football teams with the coaches. So th there is, there are sort of teams that you will lead from outside and the other teams which are egalitarian. And back to the question, academia is a creative environment. You cannot, you know, force creation to minds. They have to be inspired and they have to feel that they are going for something that is valuable for them. And that needs, requires a different flat organization, requires equal say, and from outside, the departments who are supposed to distribute the money in a responsible way should look at the process and not so what the chosen leader says. Look, look at the process and not only leadership, but personal leadership. Sean? Very quickly, I want to build on the last thing that you said and also I, I appreciate the provocative question because it's always good to think, okay, what if we do something completely different? But I think coming back to the very, very first exercise that we did today where we listed the teams we had, I, I feel like there's formal teams and informal teams, right? So what the, the team that was most important to you was the family, which got me thinking, yeah, that's right. But that's not a formal team, right? That's like an informal team. I was talking to a colleague and she was saying you know the friends are the found the found family right you know your found team these are informal teams right because nobody does anything alone right even if you have an issue you find somebody for support you might be doing something but you need you need that external validation help support whatever and that they are then part of your team at that point it's maybe not formalized but we need to maybe maybe think about it that way or, or i don't know but that, that's what i think about when i when i think about your question Formal and informal teams. We've got another question. I think it's Jeroen yep. as well. Yes. Hi. Yeah, I would like to go back to the uh, to the animal that the other Jeroen uh, int introduced uh, in, in the beginning of this uh, uh, this session. So the elephant. Um, the elephant in the room. Yeah, the elephant in the room. Maybe there's another ele elephant in the room. We have here rewards and diversified teams. And the elephant in the room is, is of course, money. Outside this room, everyone is speaking about money. If we really have diversified teams, that includes people who uh, who clean the materials in, in the lab, um, without whom the next experiment would probably fail. And we have had discussions in Utrecht where we moved to university personnel, university staff, where some people said, yes, this is nice, um, but it's not about a pat on the back. And all this, for it, to, to a certain extent, is window dressing, if we aren't looking at the income skills. So we're still having these skills going from one or maybe four nowadays to 18. Uh, my question would be for teams to be effective, what kind of income differences would you like to allow? Lovely. I think it's a nice question for looking, Renske. What kind of income Difference. differences? Yeah, so your question, what kind of differences for teams yeah, are important? I have an answer. So I have written a recently vision. I would say for the public, it would be between one and three times the modal income of the country. That's the range which is acceptable for me. And money is of course important, but I tell you, we can live with much less money. And there are many universities in the world who make great things with much less money than we have in the Netherlands. It's about who decides on the money. It's about the accountability. And if you want to see if the team functions as a team, even inside the family, just look who decides about distributing the money. I see nothing. Yeah, Renske? Yeah, okay. It, it, for me, money, I immediately, immediately have to think about the budget cuts now. So we have a problem and I'm uh, uh, working at the Faculty of Humanities in Utrecht. So uh, uh, yeah, we have a big problem over there. And I think the, the biggest, uh, my main concern is that they uh, 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 remove the estroitheid. So that's the unallocated time that you have, uh, uh, for example, as a teacher, 
uh, uh, that you can spend on your professional development. And I think this is crucial because what, what are you saying right then? You, you just have to do your work and don't reflect on it, don't share your things. So if we really make a thing about teams, then there should be time to, to um, uh, uh, learn from each other, to reflect and uh, bring it together. And I think my, my, uh, uh, one, one of my positive stories is that I uh, tried uh, uh, one time to teach together with somebody else a course. And I think this is a team in action. And here you see that you can learn from each other perspectives and that's what you need. And if you, you uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you need money and time for doing these things. And I, I think this, this is crucial for teams to work out. So I've got one final question for the four of you. And the question, yeah, there was a question, but is it, is it a short question? Hmm. <laughs> I, I actually had two questions now, but okay. I'll <laughs> I go there will be a break and people can talk with one another, yeah? I just wanted to say, uh, respond to an earlier remark made by Sean about that it starts with trust. I must admit that I think trust is one of the biggest issues, to be honest, because what happens is that there's a lot of trust from top down to, for example, full professors, and we get the chiefdoms. And I would rather have top-down management set an example of being an extremely good team and actually showing team spirit and actually protecting the people beneath them than having too much trust in people beneath them. Is it trust or are we measuring the wrong things? <laughs> are we valuing the wrong things or are, are we not trusting or are we trusting too much? Uh, I think in most cases we're just uh, laissez-faire, uh, full trust, less autonomy, and that will solve everything. And in essence, I would personally say that at least some of the universities are hardly a team or an organization themselves, but rather just a bunch of, of smart individuals. And I rather would have an organization and in essence teams. I would love your perspective on the coffee break. Definitely, that's a perfect answer. I would like to have final, I'm, I see your question and uh, you will have time to uh, attend to the panel members. One final question, one sentence answer. What do you wish the, remember, uh, the audience to remember for this topic? Sean. I have to start. I just talked. Um, the, the, it's about, I'm, I'm going to go off topic, but. One sentence. One sentence. It's about the words that we use to define culture and trust, all these things. And I am all over the place because I was just trying to be thinking about what he's saying. Uh, it's all about the words. It's all about the words. Words so change, language changes, mentalities, and mentalities change culture. So use the right words to change culture. Use the right words to change culture. Suddenly, yeah, fairness will not be brought to you on a, on a silver plate. So speak up. That's my my message. I hope you are in many environments. Speak up. The penalty is usually much less than you expect in university. You will not be punished. You might be even invited to stage to speak up. In I hear a lot of reactions on that, so that's I, probably a discussion up. worth. But speak up, Gunther. Yes, um, I would actually really like to send a positive message. My whole experience is that working in a team is very, very rewarding and makes you very happy. And I would really love it if the university would be an environment that encourages mm. this rather than discourages it. Yes. Thank you for the positive. Closure, Renske. And I would like to end with try to integrate those multiple roles of research, teaching, and, uh, uh, and impact within a team. So not have different teams working on different things. Working together. And go to the demonstration uh, <laughs> on the 14th of November. Thanks. I would like to thank the audience for the nice question. Renske Bauer, Günther Cornelis, San Lifais, and Sean. And I will say it right, Copacchio. Thank you very much. So, I would like to ask you to take a very brief moment to write down the following question in your notebook. It's just for you. Write down three insights you would like to remember. It's just for yourself. So write down in the notebook three things, three insights you would like to remember. Thank you.
So take a moment to write down your insights. So, before you can enter the coffee and tea area, I have some small announcements to make. Some very important things about the workshops. You have all a badge, and on your badge there's also which workshop you will attend and where the rooms are, which room you are in. So, very important. The A rooms, with an A, you can go outside and walk across and find them outside. The B rooms are just here, but you have to go behind the registration desk. So that's about the rooms. Um, the workshops start at 11.35. Before that, you will have time to have coffee and tea and discuss a little bit more on the topics of today. And a very nice to know, I look at you, I look at you, yes, there will be a bio walk during lunch. And I uh, really recommend it. It's all about uh, reflecting, having fresh air, and recognize and reward nature. So that's about the bio walk. That's it for me for now. I will hope to see you all back at the workshops and later on for the team note of Candy Row. Thank you very much. Enjoy your coffee and tea.